welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Like I mentioned, we're going to get into the word of the Lord. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. If you would, stand to your feet, and let's go before the Lord and invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Because listen, you didn't come to hear from me. Hey, no, don't, don't ever do that. Don't go to church to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color we could imagine. This is about us coming together and hearing from God. So let's get our hearts before the Lord, and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and to be our teacher. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise for what you've already done in this church service tonight. Thank you for just blessing us with your presence here. And God, we just love you, Lord, and and we just confess Jesus as Lord in this place tonight, God. We thank you that as we open up your word tonight, God, that you open it up to us. That you give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives, God. Give us the wisdom, the vision, the direction the touch from God that each and every one of us need, Lord. And God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. How wise you are that you can do that for each and every one of us, God, on a very personal and intimate level. And God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you would bless them as you would bless us tonight, God. Be amongst them and speak to them as well, God. And Lord, we don't think of ourselves as any better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Get your Bibles and go with me tonight to Micah chapter 6, verse number 8 once again. And tonight is Guidelines for Living, part number 2. Last time we were together, we talked about Guidelines for Living, part number 1. And if I can read to you Micah chapter 6, verse number 8... It says these words, it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, you remember last week we said these words, we said that God has given us some things, some guidelines for living, almost like uh, uh, painted lines on the road that, that if we follow those that it will get us in a direction and it will get us going to a place where we want to be. God has shown us what is good and what does he require of us. Well, he gave us three things there. He said to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before our God. And last time we were together, we talked about justice. We, We talked about doing justly and what justice is when the plan of God is carried out. I love... Uh, uh, how it was summed up to me is that what God says goes. That's plain and simple. Just if you could sum up everything we said last week in one little catchphrase, it's what God says goes. Because why? It's right in God's eyes. It's learned and developed, and it comes from a godly character. And that's what we talked about last time we were together. This week, I want to take a look at the second guideline for living. And what does it say there in Micah chapter 6, verse number 8? It says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly. And tonight... We'll talk about to love mercy. To love mercy. If you remember, we read that mercy was one of the weightier matters of the law. Jesus was talking about the tithe, and he said, hey, don't neglect your tithe, but but you you should not neglect the weightier matters of the law. You should do those things first, justice and mercy. Also, Jesus often told the people in the scripture of what, what God said, where he said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. God's desire is mercy, and therefore you and I ought to perk up and say, well, wait a second, God wants this even more than he wants sacrifice? What is this thing mercy all about? Because if God wants it, we ought to want it in our lives. And God wants us to not only want it, God wants us to love it. See, that goes beyond just liking or just having or just doing. God says, I want you to love, fall in love with mercy. Now, I started reading, and I started trying to define this word mercy. I, I, I started looking up and, and even reading commentaries and things like that, and, and I found a lot of different definitions, and they were just, well, okay. You know, they said kindness. They said mercy, merciful. They said loving, and, and as I was reading that, it didn't make much sense to love kindness. Well, you know, I guess that's cool. You love it when you're kind. You love it when someone's kind to you. You love it when God is kind. Okay, I get that. To love mercy, well, you know, a lot of people could define mercy in a lot of different ways, like, you know, when, when you don't get what you deserve, when judgment is withheld, uh, all that kind of stuff, and I thought that's okay to love that, and there definitely are applications of that that we see in the Word, but really I was still searching and still, still didn't have that peace that this is really what the, the heart expression of God was 
for you and I to love mercy. I kept reading on and kept trying to define it. And, and some, some authors simply said that this word mercy just means love, you know, just kind of love. So, so what does it mean to love love? I mean, I, I, are you in love with love? Are you loving love? Are you, are you going to love with love? I mean, I just, I didn't get it yet. And as I started to read, I found this word in the original language is used over 250 times in the Old Testament. And as I started to take a look at the scriptures where this word mercy was used, yes, it could be translated love. Yes, it could be translated kindness. But there was a theme that was running through this word. There was something that I saw as I was looking over reference after reference after reference. And that was that God is loving towards his people and he has bound himself to his people in that love. Literally, if we were to find mercy, mercy equals a loyal covenant love. When we look at that word mercy, we should see something that this is not just a, a, a surface level love. Like, you know, in America, we say we love a lot of things. You know, I love sports. I love my wife. I love hot dogs, you know. But obviously, I don't love my wife like I love sports. And, and I don't love sports like I love a hot dog, you know. So, so there's something going on here. And we have to get past that surface level understanding. This is a loyal covenant love. This is a binding love. This is a love that, that keeps us. It's a, it's a faithful love. When we take a look at this, it means that we are bound to our Lord and faithful to him unto death. It means that all we have and all that we are is his and all that he is and all that he has is ours. See, when you get into that sort of an expression to love mercy now takes on a whole new meaning. This is why we love God. Why? Because God first loved us. He was merciful towards us. The Bible describes him as a merciful God. We we're told in the Psalms that his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. See, God doesn't change. God, God doesn't shift with the times. God doesn't uh, shift with the winds or the sands or any of that kind of thing. No, God is unchangeable. God is unshakable. And God's character stays the same. Jesus Christ, the book of Hebrews tells us, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore, his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. He always has been, always is, and always will be merciful full of loyal covenant love to you and I. The Bible tells us his mercy endures forever. Wow. The Bible tells us that the earth is full of his mercy, that God delights in mercy. His mercy is on those who fear him. So as we fear God, as we, as we reverence and respect him, his mercy is upon us. And the Bible tells us that it's according to his mercy that he has saved us. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, Paul writes to Titus. He says, but it's according to his mercy, his loyal covenant love that he has saved us. See, God decided on his own and of his own accord that he was going to take care of an issue in our life. We all had a problem. We were all bound up in sin. We had all rejected God. And we had all gone astray, the Bible says. And now here God, because he loves us so much, because he can't... He, he, he can't deny himself, makes an agreement with himself that he's going to reach out. He's going to take care of that issue. He's going to be merciful to you and I. Yes, we, we didn't get what we deserved. But why didn't we get what we deserved? It's because we were now brought into a relationship, a loyal covenant love of God, and we accepted and received that free gift of salvation. And because of that, now God is merciful towards us. Why? Because he already paid the price. He already poured out the wrath of God for sin upon Jesus on the cross. And now his mercy endures forever. That means you can't take it away. You can't remove it. You can't change it. God is going to be merciful as long as we stay in that loyal covenant love. And we fear him. Therefore, his mercy is upon us. Are you guys listening tonight? So what does that mean to you and I? What does that mean? How do we do this then? To love mercy. Notice that it didn't say to do mercy. It said to love mercy. We are to do justly, we're, we're to do what God says, but we are to love mercy. So there's something different about this. It's not just a set of rules and regulations, and it's not a list of to-dos, but rather this is something that comes out of us. It's an expression. So to love mercy tonight, we're going to take a look at a couple of things of what that means to you and what that means to me as we walk this thing out and live this thing out each and every day. To love mercy, number one, is to be in Christ. To love mercy, number one, is to be 
in Christ. When you love mercy, it becomes more than something that you do, but it becomes who you are. Think about it in terms of, of a marriage, right? A marriage is, is a covenant. Marriage is an agreement. It's binding. It's the closest thing that we can see to Jesus Christ in the church, Ephesians chapter 5 tells us. And so when we look at this marriage, we can kind of get an understanding of what it means to love mercy. Why? Because when two people come together and they get married, now something takes place. There, there's something very serious, very solemn, very sacred about a marriage ceremony. These two people are coming together to agree on something. What are they agreeing on? That now we are no longer two separate individuals. Now the two have become one, the Bible says. And these two now live together. They, they operate together. They think together. They, they do life together. And even though you can see two individuals, now they are one. They are one married unit. God has joined them together. And the Bible says what God has joined together, let no man divide asunder. And so this is a lifetime commitment. That's why oftentimes in the marriage ceremony you hear, hear till death do us part. Why? Because this is loyalty unto death. I will be bound by this agreement as long as I live, as long as I have power and life to fulfill my part of the agreement. I'm going to be in there. I'm going to stick in there. I'm going to do this. That's what this loyal covenant love is about. And now the, these two individuals, they, they say vows. They stand before a representative of God. And what do they do? They, they, they share a, a covenant meal. They exchange a gift in a ring, right? And they put that on each other's finger. Now there's an outward expression of something that's happened on the inside of them. And now these two have become one. Now everything I have is, is hers and everything she has is mine. You know, when I got married, my wife took my name. Now, they wanted me to take on her name for some reason or another. I don't know why, but, but I said, no, no, we're going we're gonna to do it the traditional way. And, and, and so I, I, I talked my wife into keeping my name, and so she did. Praise the Lord. That's a joke for those of you that don't understand where it's going. Her original name was Cobra. Okay, anyways, anyways, we'll move on. We'll move on. But now, all of a sudden, everything that I had was my wife's. Everything that my wife had was mine. And, and, and no longer was it, hey, that's your money and that's my money. It was our money, you know? And, and, and to the extent that, you know, I was driving one time and I backed the car out and the side of the car hit the side of the wall there and kind of scraped it up. And my wife said, why'd you do that? I said, well, we had an accident. <laughs> See, it's ours now. <laughs> but did you know that when you get into a relationship with God, when you get into Jesus Christ, now all of a sudden everything that God has is yours and everything that you have is God so that when God says, I want you to go and I want you to do this, you say yes. Why? Because you love him. Your obedience flows from love. See, it's not good works just because it's a list of to-dos. No, it's because you absolutely are in love with your Savior and he gave his all for you, so you're going to give your all for him. But listen to this. When you get into a bind and you back the car out and you scrape the side of the wall there and you've got to fix that, you say, Lord, get out our checkbook. <laughs> I should have had a bigger amen than that. See, when we understand the loyal covenant love of God, now all of a sudden it's not about behavior modification, it's about a heart transformation. Jesus showed us what it is to love mercy when he was nailed to and hung on the cross. Jesus is the mercy of God to us. That was the ultimate act of mercy that God could have done, and is that he took our punishment on himself, being nailed to the cross. And so when we enter into this covenant relationship with him, we enter into his mercy. And the Bible tells us in the book of James that mercy triumphs over judgment. What does that mean? That means that we should have gone to hell. We deserved it. We were rebellious. We did everything contrary to the ways of God. In fact, the Bible says that we were at enmity with God. We were at war with God. But now Jesus Christ comes and he brings us together in himself and he is the mercy of God to us and mercy triumphs over judgment. Why? Because God desired it. God loves it. God wants it. God wants you and I to enter into that covenant relationship. God wants us to be a part of himself. And now we are in Christ Jesus. We are in the mercy of God. Let me show this to you in the word, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. If you don't have your Bibles tonight, we'll put it up on the overheads for you. But start bringing your Bible so you can read along. 
with us and find this stuff in your own Bible so that when you're at home, you can get back to it. Because I'm not going to be there to preach it to you when you're at home. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to take a look at verse number 4 through verse number 7. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 4. And if I could sum up the first part of Ephesians chapter 2, it basically says that we were all dirt bags. <laughs> verse number 4, but God. You, you were a dirt bag. I was a dirt bag, but God. Who is rich in what? Oh, come on, you guys got to play tonight. Who is rich in what? Mercy. Who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Verse number five, even when we were dead in trespasses, there's that dirt ball part again, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Look at verse six. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places. Where? In Christ Jesus. Wow, verse number seven, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. Once again, where? In Christ Jesus. See, when you enter into this loyal covenant love, to love mercy is to be in Christ Jesus. It's now a position that you have because Jesus Christ is the mercy of God towards us. So you enter into Jesus Christ, and that's a love relationship. God loved us, and now because God loved us, we respond to him by loving him right back. And so we love mercy when we enter into this relationship with Jesus Christ. Number one, to love mercy is to be in Christ Jesus. Second thing for tonight, to love mercy, second thing for tonight, is to look for it with expectation. To love mercy is to look for it with expectation. Have you ever been sitting at home and you're waiting for your loved one to come home? Maybe, maybe you wives are waiting for your husband to come home from work and you're sitting there looking for him to come home with expectation. Why? Because you love that boy. You just can't wait for him to come home. Men, how about this? Your wife says, I'm going shopping. I only need a couple of things from the store. <laughs> Hours later, you're still sitting there looking at the driveway, wondering when she's going to come home with expectation. Why? Because if it's taken her this long, she must be buying something for me. Well, what does that mean? See, because you love somebody, you're not just looking, you're not just sitting around, you're not just doing your own thing. It, there, there's actually a fondness and, and, and there's that expectation of when they get home, it's going to be good. Why? Because I love them and I can't wait for them and, and, and I just want to be with them. I want to be around them. I, I want to touch them. I want to smell them. I want to hold them. I want to I wanna talk. I want to, you know, relate to them. I want to I wanna chop it up. I want to, you know, laugh. I want to I wanna play. I want to, you know, all those things. Why? Because of love. Because of relationship. And, and it's no different than with our God. You know, each and every day we should have that expectation, that, that, that earnest expectation, that hope and that desire. God, where are you going to show up today? God, what are you going to do in, in my life today, God? God, what are you going to do through me today in the life of someone else? Lord, I love you. And God, I know you love me. I wouldn't even be in love with you if you didn't love me. But God, here we are. And so, Lord, I'm going to work today. What are you going to do on the job today, God? Can't wait. God, I've been asking you for a raise. Maybe today's the day, and you're looking for God with earnest expectation. God, I, I'm going to be at home raising the, the kids today and taking care of business today and, and, and cleaning up, but God, I can't wait to see what you're going to do today, God. I can't wait to see what you're going to do in my kids. I can't wait to see what you're going to do in my family. I can't wait to see what you're going to do with my neighbors, God. Oh, Lord, I'm looking for divine appointments. Why? Because you have that earnest expectation. You're looking for them. Turn with me to the book of Jude. Right before the book of Revelation is the book of Jude. If you hit the maps, turn around and come back. Second to last book in the Bible, book of Jude. Thank you for those courtesy laughs, by the way. In Jude, there's really one chapter. We're going to go to verse number 21. Jude, verse number 21, says this. It says, keep yourselves in the love of God. See, we were talking about entering into Christ Jesus. 
And so now here Jude is exhorting and he says, keep yourselves. Stay there. Where? In the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. That looking for means that you're waiting patiently. You're expectant and ready to receive it. That's really what that word is all about, looking for. That you are with open arms. God, okay, here I am. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting God. I'm expecting you to show up. God, when I go to church, I'm expecting to hear from you. God, when I praise and worship you and lift my hands to you, Lord, and start to sing to you, I'm expecting your presence, God. Lord, Lord, when I go out there and I'm, I'm purposing in my heart to share Jesus, God, I'm expecting you to open doors. God, when I put my hand to something, Lord, I'm expecting you to prosper it. Why? Because you're looking for it with that confident expectation. To love mercy is to look for it with expectation. We should look for it every day. Every day. Each new day, we should be looking for mercies. Turn with me to the book of Lamentations, back to the Old Testament. If you find the book of Isaiah, go next to Jeremiah, and then right behind Jeremiah before Ezekiel is a little book called Lamentations. Lamentations chapter number three. Lamentations chapter number three, and we're going to take a look at verse number 22 through verse number 24, talking about looking for the Lord's mercy every day with expectation. Lamentations chapter number three, verse number 22 says this. It says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Look at verse number 23. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Wow, they are new every Every morning. See, yesterday you may have had a set of mercies waiting for you that day, and you might have used them up all day yesterday, and you might have thought, well, that was the end of those mercies. But when you went to bed and you woke up this morning, God said, I got a whole new set of mercies waiting for you just for this day. And guess what? Tomorrow, when you wake up, there's going to be a whole new set of mercies waiting for you just for tomorrow. So what does that do? That builds hope. That builds expectation. Take a look at the, the next verse, verse number 24. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. See, if you didn't know that you had mercies every day, you could lose hope. You could get frustrated. You could be broke down and, and, and out and, and, and just be depressed and sit down in a blue funk and just have yourself a good cry. Why? Because, oh, I don't know if the Lord loves me. I don't know if God has anything for me. I don't know, well, you know, maybe God's mad at me. Maybe I've, maybe I've come to the end of my allowable sin limit or something like that. But the Lord says, no, 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 no. That was taken care of in the cross. Repent. Get cleansed. Let's go. I've got new mercies for you each and every day. And therefore, we can have hope. We can believe God. We can look forward to each new day with confident expectation. Every day when we wake up, we can say these words that God is going to do something great today. My goodness, I, I don't know if there's anybody in the room. Listen, I should have had a great big amen on that. God is going to do something great today. Yeah. Try it. Try it. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, thank the Lord for his new mercies for that day. And then say, Lord, I'm looking. And as you go throughout your day, just write it down. Whatever it is that God did in your life, at the end of that day, you will have a list of things that will just bless your socks off, and you won't be able to sleep the night before the next day. Why? Because you know God's got something good for you that next day, because his mercies are new every morning. Can you say amen tonight? So... To love mercy, number one, is to be in Christ Jesus. Number two is to look for it with expectation. Last thing for tonight, last thing for tonight, number three, to love mercy is to imitate the merciful one. To love mercy is to imitate the merciful one. I love my kids. I have three children. They range in ages from two to seven, so please pray for me and my wife. But we're having a, a good time. And it's so funny to see our kids, you know, imitate us. Why? Because they love us. 
And so, you know, uh, uh, sometimes the jokes that I tell, all of a sudden I'll hear my daughter telling those jokes to other people. What is she doing? She's imitating me. I'll see my son make a face or do something that, that my wife does or, you know, different, different expressions. Why? Because we love each other. You may have heard it said that imitation is the highest form of flattery or the most sincere form of flattery. So what do we do? We take a look at what the master does. Take a look at what Jesus did. Take a look at how God is merciful to us, and then we imitate. In fact, the Bible says, be imitators of Christ as dear children. What does that mean? That means that you look and you see, and monkey see, monkey do. And so we imitate. We listen, right? God listens to all of our prayers. God even listens to our complaints. So we imitate. We listen. Listen for God's voice. Listen to the voice of others. Even sometimes when we don't like what we hear, we endure it. Why? Because we're being merciful. We give. For God so loved the world that he gave. And therefore, we say, you know what? God gave, I'm going to give. Jesus Christ said, freely you have received, freely give. We pardon. What does that mean? That means that we cover an offense. We don't drum it up. We don't strike up the fire. We don't stoke the fire. No, 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 no. Let's pour some water on that bad boy. I'm going to forgive, and I'm going to move past that because why? I love you. Why? Because God loved me. I'm going to forgive you. Why? Because God forgave me. See, we're imitating. Now we're, we're taking on the very nature of God. The Bible says that we can partake in the divine nature. God's nature is to be merciful. And therefore, you and I, as we imitate God, we partake. We have with that divine nature. The work of mercy is a labor of love. Let me say that again. The work of mercy is a labor of love. See, when you and I are merciful to others, when we express that loyal covenant love of God to each other, and let me add these words, especially to other Christians, because that's what the Bible emphasizes. That work that we do is a labor of love, and when you love your work, it no longer becomes work. It becomes a joy. Now, all of a sudden, you can't wait to do what it is that God has called you to do. You can't wait to go and give. You can't wait to go and bless somebody. You can't wait to go and sit down and, and, and listen to somebody. You know, there are people that have so blessed me over the years that, that have expressed that, you know what, somebody, when they were going through a tough time, sat down with them and listened to them and cried with them and encouraged them, and now they have a heart to do that very thing. What happened? They received the mercy of God, and now they are giving the mercy of God. And now they live to give. Why? Because it blessed them. And so now freely they've received, and free, freely they're going to give. And now it's become a joy and not a burden to them. Turn me to the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, back to the New Testament. Last verse for tonight, Luke chapter number 6. Luke chapter number 6. Luke chapter number 6. Take a look at verse number 35 and verse... Number 36, these are some of those verses that sometimes we wish we could tear out of the Bible. You'll see why I said that in a second here. Luke chapter 6, verse number 35 says, but love your enemies. Don't you just want to tear that out of the Bible? <laughs> why? Because that's hard to do. That's not what feels good. No, I don't want to love my enemy. I want to punch my enemy. I want to kick him while he's down. I, I want to watch him fall. I want to, you know mess him up. I want to, you know, play with his head. I, I don't want to love him. I want to do anything but that. And yet Jesus comes along and he flips this thing upside down for us and he says, love your enemies. Do good and lend. Oh, we don't like that. But you know what we don't like even more than that? Is the next couple words. Hoping for nothing in return. Oh my goodness. Did he just say lend but don't hope to get anything back? Yeah, that's what he said. Lend, hoping for nothing in return. That means that if you lend some, okay, can, brother, can you lend me? And you help them out, right? And then they don't give it back? Jesus said, don't worry about it. Why? Because let that be a labor of love. Now, I'm not saying get used by people or abused, okay? You got to make sure that you're, 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 you're being wise and a wise steward. But if you're going to do 
that, make sure that you're hoping for nothing in return. Look at what he says. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. Wow. There's that partaking of the divine nature. Sons of the Most High means that you came from God. And you are now the children of God, birthed from God. You carry his DNA. You carry his nature. You look like God when you do these things. Look at what it says. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Man, that just blows me away when I read that. If anybody had the right to judge, to criticize, to condemn, to pull down and to humble somebody, it would be God. God could justly send people down here on the earth and be unkind to them and make everything frustrating for them on the earth and then send them to hell when it's all over and done with and he would still be just and yet he doesn't he's kind to the unthankful and the evil my goodness guys we've got to take on the nature of God verse 36 therefore be merciful just as your father also is merciful See, when you imitate God, you take on that nature and that character of God. And sometimes you do things for people and you're expecting like, you know, at the very least a card in the mail or something. Hello. But I mean, really, they should be rolling out like a sheet cake and fireworks and, you know, like a banner or something like that. And, and, and you know, yelling on a bullhorn to everybody how great you are. And they don't even say thanks sometimes. But God says, don't be in it for the thanks. Be in it to be like God. Don't be in it for the thanks. Don't be in it for the return on your investment. Don't be in it for any of those things. Be in it to be like God. That's what God desires. Now, notice that there are two things that we've talked about so far in guidelines for living. The first one was doing justly. The second one was loving mercy. I want to compare these two for a second. Doing justly comes from our will to do what God says. Loving mercy comes from a new nature and a heart that has received mercy. To do justly is to do what the just one requires. To love mercy is to do what love requires. Did you get a hold of that? To do justly is to do what the just one requires. To love mercy is to do what love requires. That's where this should flow. I, I love what Mother Teresa said. She said, I see Jesus in every human being. I say to myself, this is hungry Jesus. I must feed him. This is sick Jesus. This one has leprosy or gangrene. I must wash him and tend to him. And listen to how she sums this up. I serve because I love Jesus. That's where our actions come from. We don't do good just because it's the thing to do, because it's cool or it's popular or we're trying to get points with God. No, we do good because we have a heart for our Lord Jesus Christ. And we end up loving what he loves, which is people. Tonight, guidelines for living. To do justly, to love mercy. Mercy, the loyal covenant love. To love mercy is number one, to be in Christ. To love mercy is number two, to look for it with expectation. And last thing for tonight, to love mercy is to imitate the merciful one. If you got something from the Lord, come on, give him some praise tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good, so good. Hey, I want to talk to you guys for a second. I want nobody to get up, no one to leave during this time. I want you to just stay put for a moment. And I want, to give you, want you to give me a couple more minutes of your attention. I've got a couple more things we're going to do tonight. And yes, we are going to receive the offering at the end. But right now, I believe that the Lord is speaking to some of you guys. And tonight, as we've talked about this loyal covenant love, you realize, you know what? I haven't even taken that first step. I, I hear what you're saying, Pastor. I hear that God is loving and, and, and God is good and God is kind and merciful and all those things. But I'm not experiencing that myself. And you found yourself wanting. You found yourself maybe feeling terrible. Kind of feel sick on the inside like there's, there's something lacking in your life. You say, Pastor, I, I don't feel worthy to come to Jesus. And yet God never asks you to be worthy before you can come to him. In fact, you will never be worthy on your own. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say, check it out, nowhere in the Bible 
Does it say you can be good enough to get into heaven? You're not going to get to heaven just by being good. Because the standard is perfection, and no one was perfect except for one. His name is Jesus. You're not going to get to heaven by being good, by cleaning up your act. You can't do it. Can't do it. Can't be good enough to get to heaven. Sometimes people think that they'll be worthy or or that they can get to heaven by, by simply being raised in church. Parents told them they were Christians growing up. They had a cross for St. Christopher hung around their neck. They, they went to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism class. And, and, and they were born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. Might have been baptized or christened as a child. And you're not any other religions. You're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, you're a Christian headed for heaven, denying hell. Problem with that is that nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, and your parents tell you that you're Christians growing up. That, that gets you right with God and you get to go to heaven, deny your presence in hell. Not going to make it. Not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or Christian as a child, or be born in America, and that gets you into heaven. Not going to make it. And again, nowhere do I see in the Bible that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. Listen up tonight. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. Sometimes people think that they'll make themselves worthy or or, or that they're they're going to get to go to heaven because they attend church. You say, Pastor, I'm sitting in church service tonight. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian headed for heaven? Doesn't that make me right with God because I came to church tonight? I realize my lack and my need, and therefore I came to church. Not going to make it just by sitting in church. Nowhere in the Bible says sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Any more than you can go down to the ocean, sit in the water, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. No, that just makes you a wet human sitting there in the water. Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. You're not going to make it. I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. Sometimes people think, well, Pastor, okay, I understand all that, but my last church I got involved. I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions at that church. People thought of me as a leader. I taught in the Bible class, even got a membership card to that church. While I think that's great and I'm glad you did those things, could you show that to me in the Bible? Because it's not there. No one in the Bible say help out, get involved, sing in the choir, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, teaching the Bible classes, you get to go to heaven. It's not there. And again, nowhere do I see in the Bible, God is looking for a membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. Listen, if that's how you think you're going to get to go to heaven, you're not going to make it. Sometimes people say, but wait, I know God. I mean, doesn't that make me a Christian? I I know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you out of Old and New Testament, could tell you stories out of the Bible. And I know God. Therefore, I'm a Christian headed for heaven. But the problem with that is, have you read your Bible? The Bible says the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and can quote scriptures. You'll find that in the Bible. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven and denying hell. Everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. But rather, this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. In fact, Jesus made a statement to a religious leader of his day. And he said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals, but this is not about what society says. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. Not going to make it to heaven unless you've given God all of your heart and all of your life and you've been born again. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible, last book, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us in this church tonight. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are pretty graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what does he say? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God? Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected 
and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hands. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor, I want to be born again. I want to give God all my heart and all my life, be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. Why? Because think of it. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on. No one's that dumb. Tonight, you can give God all of your heart. You can give God all of your life in this safe and friendly place. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Listen, I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. Count it. You can put it right back down. He says, but if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, hey, your call, your choice. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God, or you can give God all of your heart and all of your life. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or wherever you're at watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, come on, you can get right with God by simply raising your hand and then telling an usher or coming into the church service right afterwards. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. Who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart and life? Come on, tonight, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in your heart? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. Count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, there's two, there's three. Thank you. God bless you. There's four. Gotcha. Up here. Anybody else real quick? There's five up top. Gotcha. Anybody else? There's five wise people already. Thank you. There's six right there. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Got six wise people already. Anybody else? Six. I got you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Six. Anybody else real quick? Six wise people. Anybody else? I got you already. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Anybody else? Man, these people are excited. They love the Lord. Amen. Anybody else real quick? You know you need to do this. You're sitting there and you're wondering if you should. On. You should. You should. Anybody else real quick? We got six wise people already. I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. If that's you, just pop your hand up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else on this side? Anybody else over here? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for six wise people tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now listen, all six of you, or if you're number seven, You should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, it's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. No one's going to leave. We're all going to stay put during this time. We're going to give you a clap and a shout and invite you to come forward during that time. Okay? Listen, you don't get saved by simply raising your hand. you got to give God all your heart and all your life. We want to change destinies with you tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So come on tonight. Let's all stand. And if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Just make your way to the front. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Meet me up front right here. Come on down. Come on. Come on. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. They're still coming. Come on. You can come too. Hallelujah. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Come on. Anybody else, if you need to come, come on. You can just make your way to the front right now. All right, all right. Hey, you guys. Thank God you guys have come. This is the best decision of your entire life. So you can put a smile on your face. Not a bad thing. This is a good thing, okay? Um, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. Right over here to my right. See this guy in the cool shirt? This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really neat guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance so that you're not wondering, are they crazy? Are they going to do something weird? Listen, no, no, nothing weird. He's cool, all right? He's going to do three things. First thing he's going to do, he's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. And you're going to be born again, all right? Brand new on the inside. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you free stuff. That's cool. Free stuff, all right? A couple little booklets that our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? And then... Uh, another little booklet that he wrote called 35 Days of Spiritual Personal Training. We want to do number three, introduce you to a friend in church. 
Listen, if you don't have a friend in church, you'll go back to your old friends, and they won't take you the way of church. They'll take you their own way, right? So you need a friend in church that'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Spiritual personal trainer is that friend that will do that, okay? It's five weeks, it's quick, it's easy, and it's free, okay? You need to do this. Now, let me, let me encourage you in something, okay? If you will give this church one year of your life, the rest of your life, you're going to look back on that one year and say, oh, my goodness, look how life is. I never knew it could be this good. Now, that one year starts with five weeks with an SPT. Like I mentioned, it's free. Pastor Dave will describe it, and then he'll let you come right back out, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo!